In the first half of this lecture, uh, I described the instructional design theory underlying first principles of instruction. Once we have established uh, this instructional design theory, it's possible to use this theory to build a model of instructional design. As I will describe in a few minutes, I believe that this pebble in the pond model of instructional design not only implements first principles of instruction more effectively, but overcomes some of the limitations of the more traditional ISD approach to instructional design. Uh, this figure illustrates the primary products of the pebble in the pond model for instructional design. The metaphor is an environmental pond in which instruction is to occur. The pebble is an instance of a problem that learners need to be able to solve in the context of the pond. The problem pebble thrown into the instructional pond is the trigger for the instructional design process. The instructional products comprising the first ripple are a prototyped demonstration of this problem. The second ripple is a progression of problems of the same type. The instructional products comprising this second ripple are demonstrations or applications of each problem in the progression. The third ripple is the component skills required to solve this class of problems. The instructional products comprising this third ripple are demonstrations or applications for each of the component skills as they are taught in the context of the problems in the progression. The fourth ripple is to enhance the instructional strategies and consists of structural frameworks and peer interaction added to the problem demonstration and applications. The fifth ripple is to finalize the design and includes the final design for the interface, navigation, supplemental instructional materials, and other items that may be required for an effective product. The sixth ripple is evaluation and contains data collection, formative evaluation, and prototype revision. The pebble in the pond model of instructional design attempts to overcome some of the limitations of the more traditional ISD or instructional systems development model. Let me attempt to describe four unique properties of the pebble in the pond model for instructional design. Instructional systems development, or ISD, is the most frequently used instructional design approach. This approach emphasizes a series of steps that are supposed to result in an instructional product that is effective and efficient. The problem is not that the steps are the wrong steps, but rather that the emphasis is on the procedure rather than on the instructional design products. The steps in the instructional design procedure are not what lead to an E3 learning consequence. Rather, it is the products that these steps produce that are the conditions for producing the desired learning outcomes. The pebble in the pond model prescribes steps that have been found to lead to instructional products that do result in an E3 learning consequence. In the pebble model, these instructional products are a mock-up of the actual instruction using multimedia to create a functional prototype of the instruction rather than an abstract description. The traditional ISD model commences with a number of steps that describe the content to be presented. The early steps in the traditional ISD model are information oriented rather than portrayal oriented. That is, they describe what is to be done rather than showing what is to be done. For example, instructional strategies are often represented as information. They are merely descriptions of how learners will interact with the content. A content first approach designs with the portrayals of the content rather than with information about the content. The pebble in the pond approach begins the design process with a portrayal of an instance of the problem learners will learn to solve. This problem is a portrayal of the goal to be accomplished rather than an abstract description of the problem and its solution.
The ISD model prescribes a cumulative content sequence. A cumulative sequence first teaches the subordinate skills one by one. Finally, after all the subordinate skills required to accomplish the instructional goal have been taught, learners are required to use the skills in an integrated way to solve a problem or accomplish a complex task. This cumulative content sequence often suffers from several limitations. First, if the content is complex, then it is possible but by the time learners are required to apply the skills, they may have forgotten some of them. Second, without a context, its relevance may not be apparent to learners. Acquiring skills in a cumulative fashion often brings to mind the teacher phrase we all learn to dread. You won't understand this now, but later it will really be important to you. The pebble in the pond approach overcomes this problem by demonstrating an instance of the problem to be solved as one of the first learning activities in the sequence. Seeing a portrayal of an actual problem and a demonstration of its solution is far more easily understood by learners than an abstract statement describing the problem. The pebble approach then demonstrates the component skills specifically required for this problem and demonstrates how each of these specific instances of each skill was used to solve the problem. Rather than an abstract objective stating what learners will be able to do, learners are shown what they will be able to do with a concrete demonstration of an actual instance of the problem. The content sequence in the pebble model is not cumulative it is problem-centered. The component skills are taught in the context of a progression of problems. The ISD model produces a number of instructional design products as a result of carrying out the steps in the instructional design procedure. Most of these instructional design products are abstract descriptions of the content and and the instructional strategy to be developed. The actual design of the content materials usually does not take place until after the objectives assessment and instructional strategy have all been described. Typically this process produces an instructional design document or, or specification. A significant problem with this approach is the number of translation errors that can occur when developing the actual instruction from the abstract design document. It is frequently the case that the instructional strategies, as implemented, are often significantly different from the design envisioned by the designer who wrote the specification. The translation problem results in misunderstandings and almost always delays the efficient development of the instruction. Critics have been quick to identify the long de delays that result as a significant weakness of the ISD process. The Pebble model attempts to overcome this problem by developing a functional prototype. A functional prototype is a mock-up of the instructional strategy that includes actual content material and that allows learner interaction with the instructional strategies. A functional prototype approximates the learner interaction in the final product. I developed a functional prototype for a short course on photographic composition. The problem for the students was to recognize a photograph uh, as to whether it was well composed or to take a photograph that was well composed. First Principles prescribes three instructional events for a problem demonstration. They are indicated in the upper right hand corner. Show the consequence, that is the solution to the problem. Show the conditions that led to that consequence. And show the steps that produced those conditions. I've tried to demonstrate these instructional events in this problem demonstration. I will play the audio explanation. This picture tells a story. The pitch is about to be delivered. Will it be a strike or will the batter be out? There are several things that contribute to the composition of this photograph. The pitcher is clearly the subject of the photograph. 
There is no distracting background except the coach who contributes to the tension of the event. There is a clear and simple object of interest. Flick continued to go on. The primary point of interest in the photograph is the pitcher's wind-up. A composition is more interesting when the point of interest falls on one of the points where these imaginary dividing lines cross. Click continue to go on. Finally, the pitcher uses a horizontal format with the pitcher at the left of the photograph so that he's throwing into the photograph. Click next to go to the next frame. In this problem demonstration, the uh, consequence, of course, is a well-composed photograph, which was shown here. The conditions are listed down the left-hand side as they are explained. This particular demonstration did not show the steps that were used to, uh, uh, to modify this photograph to create a good composition. I have an additional comment to make. Uh, this is an illustration of a functional prototype. This one was built in PowerPoint 210. PowerPoint 210 has some very uh, advanced features which I have demonstrated here. One is the use of triggers. That is, any object on the screen can be used as a trigger for some other object to appear to be animated. In this demonstration, I added bookmarks at appropriate places in the audio so that the words simplicity, rule of thirds, and horizontal format would appear as they are described. The uh, second ripple in the pebble in the pond model is to now design a problem progression. That is, a series of problems such that when the student has learned to solve each of the problems in the progression, they will have acquired the skill that is being taught. In our case, this would be a series of photographs that students would either be asked to recognize whether they have good composition or to actually improve the composition by uh, editing or by cropping the photographs as we demonstrated earlier. The steps involved in designing a problem progression are indicated here. Uh, first of all, the component skills need to be identified. Then there needs to be a progression of problems. Uh, and then we need to design demonstration and application for each of the problems. Uh, I will try to demonstrate here a format that we use to try to determine the problem progression. The first step in designing a problem progression was to collect a whole series of photographs. I actually did that, only a few of which are shown here. Uh, then I took this series of photographs and I looked at and said, what are the component skills that I wanted to teach? Uh, we felt like there were uh, several conditions that contributed to a good photographic composition. These are listed down the left side. These involved simplicity, the rule of thirds, format, frame, and line. Uh, these were all characteristics or conditions of a photograph that involved good composition. And each of these conditions will be taught in turn. I then identified some steps that would lead to these conditions. When you have a photograph that isn't as good a composition as you would like, it may be possible to improve the composition by cropping the photograph or by editing out unwanted elements. So here are our conditions and our steps for producing a good photograph. And here are a series of five photographs that we arranged in what we thought was would be a good sequence. The, re the way we determined this sequence was to look at where in each of these things the we, we planned to demonstrate the conditions. So if you see the X's here, under this first photograph, D, uh, we will demonstrate the rule of thirds and format. And we will also uh, talk about or demonstrate the step of posing the subject and using the viewfinder. Uh, in the next photograph, uh, we would also demonstrate the rule of thirds and format, 
We can also then improve this photograph uh, by cropping to improve its simplicity, which we will also demonstrate. Each of the question marks indicate that the, photo the original photograph could be improved by applying this step down below, that these three conditions, simplicity, rule of thirds, and format, could be improved by cropping. So this is our problem progression. Uh, we would then create a demonstration and or application for each of these problems. Having designed a problem demonstration and application and having designed a progression of problems and having designed either application or demonstration for those problem progression, the next step is to design the component skills that are involved in these problems. Listed here are two of the steps that are required to create component skills. In our functional prototype, uh, this particular demonstration of a component skill demonstrates both the steps of posing the subject using the viewfinder and the condition of rule of thirds. Uh, listen and watch the demonstration. I wanted to show my subject actively involved with his model railroad. Candid photos are fun and sometimes really capture the action of the story you want to tell. However, you usually have more control over the photograph if you compose your subject. For this photograph, I tried several different poses. In this pose, there are really two subjects, the operator and his train. They compete for your attention. The background in this photograph is also distracting. I decided to try another pose. In this pose, I looked more carefully through my viewfinder to try to eliminate the distracting background. I think that it is better than my first pose. However, my intent was to photograph the owner of the model railroad, not the railroad itself. In this pose, the train is the primary subject of the photograph, and we only see the back of the operator's head. I felt I needed a different pose to better capture the involvement of my intended subject. I tried a different pose by having the owner make a repair on his railroad rather than running a train. This eliminated the train as a competing subject of the photograph. By carefully adjusting what I could see through the viewfinder, I was better able to capture the concentration on the subject's face as he made his repair. His gaze also directed my view to his hands, which are making the repair. This provided a more dynamic feeling in this photograph. This pose also better implements the rule of thirds. Note that the face of the subject is at the upper right intersection of the lines that divide the photograph into thirds horizontally and vertically. In addition, his hands are at the lower left intersection of these lines. Implementing the rule of thirds improves the composition. The instructional events necessary for demonstrating a component skill involve telling and showing the condition and telling and showing the step that led to that condition. This slide did that slightly in reverse order. It talked about posing and using the viewfinder. And then it demonstrated the condition that resulted from these steps in uh, creating the rule of third. It then demonstrated the condition that resulted from executing these steps. The previous slide had demonstrated teaching of a component skill. This slide combines demonstration and application. The instructional events are listed on the, the lower right, and the check boxes on the left side of the slide provide an opportunity for the learner to indicate whether or not the photograph as shown includes the conditions rule of third simplicity and whether or not it was posed. The student would also receive feedback, uh, as demonstrated previously, when they hit the submit button after checking the appropriate boxes for the conditions. This slide then also demonstrates the step of editing. Uh, please listen and watch. The composition of this photograph could be improved if we eliminated the woman and the man in the background. They are distracting elements from the subject of this photograph, which is the woman and her child. We can edit this photograph by using the clone tool. The clone tool enables us to select a section of the background 
and replace other sections of the background with that. I will demonstrate the use of the clone tool. I first click on the tool and adjust the size. Once I have selected the clone tool, I must select an area on the screen. I can now move over and use that section of the background to replace another section of the background. So in doing it in this way, I can slowly eliminate the woman in the picture by replacing her with the background. I continually select the pieces that I want to, uh, to use. I won't continue to do this demonstration, but essentially using this same procedure, selecting a part of the background, using that to replace a figure in the background, I can eliminate the figures in the background. In this way, I can simplify the photograph and make it a much better composition. You need to work carefully, of course, to completely eliminate the figures in the background. But by so doing, we'll, we will have simplified the photograph and improved its composition. The other instructional events that are required for teaching a component skill are to be able to identify a step as to whether it's executed appropriately when they see it, and to actually execute the step. After designing appropriate demonstration and application for the component skills, the next step in the Pebble model is to design assessment. This involves two activities. One is examining your prototype to see those slides where it would be appropriate to collect data from the student. And second, to modify the prototype so that it can actually collect and save student data. PowerPoint, which we are using for our prototype, does not have the capability to collect data built into the program. PowerPoint has the capability of being extensible. That is, you can add Visual Basic macros, which will enable it to collect data and to save them into a student file. The details of these macros are beyond the uh, intent of this short demonstration, but are described the, in my book, The First Principles of Instruction. Here is a slide from our functional prototype. This uses the same format that we had previously seen for asking the students to recognize whether or not the photograph includes the conditions which have been taught. They do this by checking the box. The underlying macros will save the students' responses to these checkboxes, and when they hit the submit button, will save these responses to a student file. This is also a combination slide which also demonstrates the condition of framing it also has an application, uh, which I will demonstrate. The photograph is ready to be cropped. Click on the crop tool above the photograph and outline the area of the photograph that you wish to retain. Try to enhance the composition features of rule of thirds, format, and framing. Click the done button when you're satisfied with your cropping. Again, this particular prototype does not include the ability for the student to actually crop in our prototype but it does provide feedback that the student would receive after they've completed the cropping. My crop lines are shown in red. Are they similar to your crop lines? When you've finished comparing your crop lines with mine, click on the Done button again. Notice how the landscape format was retained, but how it now implements the rule of thirds. Notice how the excess foliage was removed by cropping, and the foliage now frames the face of the child. Cropping significantly improved the composition of this photograph. The advantage of a functional prototype is that it can be adapted to actually collect data. Therefore, you can use your functional prototype as part of your formative evaluation. Based on the data you collect from your functional prototype, you can then make appropriate revisions to your module. This concludes this uh, brief introductory lecture on first principles of instruction. I've tried to briefly indicate the instructional design theory that underlies first principles and to briefly illustrate the pebble in the pond model for instructional design. If you are listening to this lecture online and uh, I am available, please ask me a question. If you are viewing this a presentation and I am not online, please feel free to send your questions 
to me at my email address, professordavemerrill at gmail.com. I hope that you have enjoyed this presentation, and I hope that you enjoy first principles of instruction. I think that it will make the courses you design more effective, efficient, and appealing. And I believe that it will help you select courses for your students that will also be more effective and efficient and appealing. Thank you very much.